Okay, we're going to move quickly on the issue of uh, human rights in Africa, and we want to hear from this panel. The ideal being uh, the United States Congress, the, the U.S. administration, and those of us in the civil society here, we need to hear what Africans are saying. What are you saying about human rights in Africa? We know what we're saying about it, but we also need to hear what our African colleagues are saying. What I'm going to do is really briefly introduce the panel, and then you stand up when I call your name. I'm going to call on the, the, um, the tone setter last. But, uh, so let me go with uh, Tutu Alicante. Stand up. I, I've read all your stuff over the last several years. This is a dynamic guy. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Sharon from Eritrea. All right. Uh, you can hold your applause. Buram Da Abid uh, from Mauritania. Yeah. Uh, Briani Dawson from Rwanda. Briani? Yeah. Uh, Shek Diop uh, from Senegal. Shek Diop here? Okay. Uh, Nigeri Gaturu from Kenya. No? Uh, Sifo Gumetzi, Swaziland. No? Anybody? Uh, how about uh, Rosalind Hanzi? Uh, Rosalind Hanzi uh, from Zimbabwe. She's the one who's putting pressure and heat on Comrade. Um, Mampasaka Steve Lesiki from uh, the Lesbian Gay by Trans uh, South African National AIDS Council in South Africa. All right. Uh, Maria Mabatu uh, from Mozambique. Uh, Tina Masu Masuya from Uganda. Huh? Vincent Nakawa Nakawani from uh, Swaziland. Huh? Okay. Uh, Joel uh, Od Odigi. No? You guys got some hard names. I know most of them. How about, how about Arnold Sun Sunga? All right. Did I miss anybody? All right. Uh, no, no, he's, a, he's, a, he's a speaker from which country? Zimbabwe. From where? Cote d'Ivoire. D'accord. Okay, the tone setter for this one is Dr. Livingston Sawanyana, who is the executive director for the Foundation for Human Rights Initiative. And what we're going to do is ask him to set the tone uh, for the panel, and then we're going to give the panelists whoever else have comment, a chance to make a comment, and then we wanted to open it up for the questions. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Samoyana, the microphone is yours. <clears throat> Dear friends and colleagues, good morning. I have here with me a high-powered delegation to make a presentation on a very important subject of human rights in Africa. Delegates to the U.S. Africa Summit welcome the U.S. initiative to convene a platform to reflect on the situation of human rights in Africa. And in this regard, would like to thank the USID, NED, and Freedom House for making our participation in this historic forum possible. In view of that, we make the following observations and recommendations. That much more work needs to be done to uphold the rule of law, respect for human rights, democracy, and sustainable development in Africa. That poverty is still prevalent and it impacts adversely on individuals' access to health care, education, social security, employment, and the ability to exercise fundamental rights. That conflict and existing inequalities are responsible for the current refugee flaws, insurgency, high prevalence of HIV AIDS, and the high child and maternal mortality rates. That this is largely attributed to the inadequate attention to democratic practices and to the abuse of fundamental rights. Mindful, therefore, of the need to encourage ratification 
and strengthening the implementation and compliance with international and regional human rights standards, recognizing the necessity to increase access to justice, eliminate impunity, internal displacement, and abolish the death penalty, we recommend that deliberate efforts are made to uphold the rule of law by addressing the following three priority areas. One, respect for civil liberties, in particular, freedom of expression, association, and assembly. Two, respect for diversity, equality, and creating a culture of tolerance. And three, inclusive social economic rights. With respect to the first, civil liberties in particular, freedom of expression, association, and assembly, we recommend that, one, bilateral and multilateral trade agreements and any other aid programs to Africa should adhere to human rights obligations and fundamental principles enshrined in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and the African Union Constitutive Act. Two, that the U.S. should demonstrate stronger public support and solidarity with human rights organizations, the broader civil society, and human rights defenders. And three, the United States should increase funding, including institutional core support available to support local human rights organizations, including support for impact work, such as strategic public interest litigation, research, documentation, and community empowerment. With regard to the second area, respect for diversity, equality, and creating a culture of tolerance, we recommend that the United States should, one, support programs and initiatives by civil society organizations that address equal recognition, protection, and inclusion of all marginalized groups in Africa, such as LGBTI and human rights defenders. Two, including their bilateral and multilateral cooperation agreements with African states, the importance of recognition, protection, and inclusion of diverse groups in society, including women and girls, LGBT and ethnic minorities. With respect to inclusive socioeconomic rights, this high-powered delegation recommends that one, in the field of development cooperation, the United States should prioritize programs that address the social and economic needs of the most vulnerable and marginalized sections of society, including advancing women and the girl empowerment. Two, as the United States investment in Africa increases, it should guarantee corporate social responsibility. And third and final, the U.S. should accelerate economic development requirements through aid packages and trade and investment policy. We also made recommendations to African states and our peers in the civil society fraternity. However, for this purpose, we have decided to restrict our presentation to recommendations to the U.S. government. But you are free to raise any matter on this subject uh, regarding our recommendations to uh, African states and civil society as you wish. Now, in conclusion, as the United States and Africa increase their business cooperation, respect for individual rights must remain supreme. Human rights are universal values. I thank you.
Thank you very much. I want to add that the part of this process is that the task force have been meeting all yesterday to agree on the paper. And uh, the beautiful thing about this is that they're coming from different countries in Africa, different uh, issues that they're dealing with across the continent. And personally, uh, I'm excited about this. Uh, I thought that your presentation was excellent, uh, but uh, we want to give the other members any chances to weigh in uh, who might have missed something. So the, uh, please, grab the mic. You got it? Oui, mais j'ai besoin de quelqu'un qui me traduit du français à l'anglais. Ah, non, mais lui, il n'a pas d'écouteur. Les autres n'ont pas d'écouteur. Pardon euh, Oui. Ah. Je n'ai vu pas que l'on de, de l'écouteur. Est-ce que les... C'est bon Ok. Oui, voilà. Oui, voilà. Oui, mais, mais, mais je n'ai pas vu les gens qui ont les écouteurs. Bon. Je probably need a probably need a, a French speaker who can interpret. Ok, got it. Go ahead. Bon, je, voudrais, je ne voudrais pas euh, rater cette occasion, car je viens de l'Afrique, et portant sur le cœur un fardeau très, très lourd, une responsabilité très lourde, ça rendre compte d'une question importante en Afrique, pour beaucoup d'Africains, pour des millions d'Africains, mais qui est le laissé pour compte dans les forums internationaux des droits humains. C'est l'esclavage par ascendance, c'est la traite orientale, la traite arabe. Euh, nous, nous sommes... Attendez un peu, s'il vous plaît. Est-ce que vous pouvez vous lever, s'il vous plaît, pour que je puisse vous voir Ah, ok. Non, juste pour que je, ça m'aide à interpréter. Oui. Ok. So, je peux m'asseoir vais... Oui, vous pouvez vous asseoir. Et je vais traduire petit à petit. Donc, okay. attendez un peu un moment. Um, he was saying that he's coming from Africa uh, and he can't come without talking about louder. He cannot come from Africa without uh, expressing uh, an important issue, which was. C'était quoi le problème, monsieur? Le problème, c'est l'esclavage par ascendance, la traite, l'esclavage par la naissance, la traite des noirs en Afrique, la traite arabe qui continue en Afrique. Uh, the, one of the main issues is slavery. Uh, it's uh, slavery by Africans. Je viens de la Mauritanie, où 20% de la population mauritanienne sont des esclaves par ascendance des propriétés d'autres de, de, personnes. Ils naissent propriété d'autres personnes. I come from Mauritania, where 20% of the population is a, is a slave. They belong to other people. They're born uh, as slaves, belonging to other people. Donc, c'est des personnes qui n'ont pas le droit aux pièces d'état civil, des personnes qui travaillent sans repos, sans salaire, sans soins, confinées dans les travaux forcés et dans le viol. People who have no rights, um, no health, Uh, they are raped and uh, they don't e they have no civic rights et tout ça c'est sacralisé par un code noir un code d'esclavage qui est toujours en vigueur en Mauritanie et qui est élevé au niveau du sacré dans mon pays euh, vous pouvez répéter s'il vous plaît j'ai dit que le code noir qui a été aboli aux États-Unis depuis deux siècles, il est toujours en vigueur en Mauritanie et il est élevé par la constitution mauritanienne au niveau du sacré. Uh, the black people that were um, freed... Slavery code. Sorry, pardon? Il y a un slavery code, un code d'esclavage qui est toujours en vigueur chez nous oh, en Mauritanie. There's a slavery code that's still um, in, implemented in Mauritania. Uh, Monsieur Manso, au moins on doit prendre en fait les réponses, questions-réponses. Donc, euh, je Mais je veux, je veux poser la question ah, okay, oui. Quel est votre aux États-Unis d'Amérique, uh -huh. aux représentants de l'Amérique. Pourquoi ils continuent à voter de l'argent 
beaucoup d'argent au gouvernement d'un pays qui continue à pratiquer l'esclavage ancestral sur plus okay, de la moitié uh, de son peuple. Okay, donc, to, uh, oui, uh, I think donc, I, on va demander à l'audience de quick? demander des questions. Summarize real quick. No, I will just tell him that we're going to ask the people now to start. We'll open it up to the floor. Yeah, yeah we need to open it up. But on a su ce que vous avez dit, monsieur. J'ai traduit. Il y a un code d'esclavage qui existe toujours en Mauritanie. Et I, I, I sent the message that there's still a slavery code in Mauritania. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the issue is, is, is very strong, and it gets into other countries. In fact, I've been to Mauritania, so I understand uh, the challenges. Uh, so the point is, we're but we need to open it up for Q&A. But I want to give a chance for any other panelists who have a short comment. Anybody else? Uh, let's, who have a short? Let's just open it up to the chairman. Let's open it to the public. Okay. And then let's, uh, uh, those who have questions, we have microphones on both sides. Line up uh, for anybody who have a question or comment. Right here, microphone. Okay, we have one over there and we have one here. Microphone. Huh? Yeah, just line up at the microphone. Why don't you hold your hand up so you know where it is? Right here. Okay, we have the. Okay, question, question? So we got a little more time? Yeah. We we you understand? We have a little bit more time for anybody else who have a comment on the presentation. That's it. Okay, okay go ahead, please. If there are people in the room who would like to listen to French speakers and they do not understand French, in the back we have Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Arnold Tsunga from Zimbabwe, working with the International Commission of Jurists. One thing that I just want to say, complimenting what our uh, Chairperson for the group said, uh, is generally around the issue of, uh, you know, development and implementation of human rights standards within the African continent. One thing that we realized and acknowledged as a panel is that uh, the African Union countries have uh, adopted quite a number of progressive international human rights law standards. We have also seen that the African Union has established institutions and organs that are supposed to be uh, there to monitor the implementation of those human rights standards. What was of concern when we identified the areas that the chairperson for the group spoke about is the gap between standards as adopted by the African Union states and the implementation. So that uh, mismatch between standards and practice is the issue that made us come to the recommendations that we have done. And as a result, we also made quite some recommendations to the African Union, which focus around the obligations and the need to work uh, in implementing human rights standards on the African continent, the need to uh, comply with the decisions that have been made by the treaty monitoring bodies, by judicial and subjudicial organs, where there have been cases of violations of human rights, because we saw that there has been a, a big um, failure on the part of states to implement uh, decisions coming from African sub-regional institutions of justice. I thought that is important to add as well. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Um, thank you so much. My name is Steve Litsike from South Africa. Um, I want to emphasize on the point made by our colleague um, uh, uh, Livingston who presented. You know, the respect um, for diversity, equality, and ensuring inclusion is very critical for us because when you look at inequality issues such as gender gaps that exist, and also the high prevalences that we're experiencing in sub-Saharan Africa, in, uh, to be more specific, around HIV and AIDS, and, and also women bearing uh, 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 the cycle of inequalities is very critical. I want to really emphasize 
on, on, on building capacity of local initiatives to continue addressing uh, the needs uh, uh, of, 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 of marginalized population and also initiatives that are led by community-based organization for sustainability purpose. I think it's very key if you were to address any uh, uh, empowerment and economic sustainability is really to support the local based initiative but really to em uh, emphasize on women and LGBTI community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I just want to, uh, when we met... Um, Introduce yourself again. Arthur Guagua from Zimbabwe. Uh, I, I want to talk about the issue of you know, responsibility in trade and business, but also in counter-terrorism. We discussed you know, that issue at length yesterday. And when we came here in June, that question arose. The US government asked us for advice that how do we deal with countries like Ethiopia, Uganda, uh, which are supporting the US government mm. in counter-terrorism uh, efforts, but they've got a bad human rights record. So you've got a good friend who is helping you but you know, they are bad you know, for their own people. Um, we struggled you know, to come up with answers yesterday, but I think what we thought was, I think the United States uh, has to be, I think, pretty clear you know, to these countries you know, to say that you know, the fact that you're supporting us in counterterrorism efforts, uh, those are good values. So why don't you reflect the same values in the way you treat your own people? Um, so if the United States keep on tolerating uh, or maybe sapping with the devil, that's a form of you know, corruption in a way. In other words, you know, they are tolerating bad behavior. So what we thought was that any efforts to uh, suppress insurgency should be in line with, should be compatible with international law and human rights standards. And then finally, on responsibility towards business, we know the U.S. wants to invest in Africa. We know the issue of you know, real politics. Uh, but we don't want you know, the United States to go the ch Chinese way, where they build, build a school here, a clinic here, a dam there, without reference you know, to human rights. So we, we want you, we would advise the U.S. government to, to adhere to the human rights-based approach so that you make yourself different from China, to say, no, we are different. We are responsible in the way we do business. Thank you. That's great. Uh, let's go to the women here. Uh, Ms. Sharon from uh, Eritrea. We, uh, Elizabeth Sharon from Eritrea. Um, just to add on to what uh, our chairman said on uh, uh, increasing the guarantee on corporate social responsibility, it's not only the U.S. Uh, uh, is uh, showing interest or increasing uh, investment in Africa, but we have also other actors like China, China is really uh, wildly uh, investing in uh, Africa and they do not seem to be interested in human rights. And also we have the Canadians and Australian companies uh, also investing. And we would be really uh, grateful if the U.S. could really help organize uh, such kind of uh, conference uh, together with the Chinese and the EU, also other actors. Uh, with the civic society so that we can raise our concerns. Because if we are asking and all those, uh, we're putting all those recommendations to the U.S. government, we should be equally uh, putting those recommendations to the Chinese and bringing all those cheap commodities to Africa, for example. And we should be really uh, challenging that. So we should be uh, somehow, there should be a venue for us to, to voice our concerns collectively and inclusively we have to bring them on board. We cannot uh, just uh, you know, target some countries and leave the others taking uh, away all our resources and ignoring our sufferings in, in our continents. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is getting good now. Let's go next to you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, we also discussed... Uh, introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Rosalind Hansi from Zimbabwe. We also discussed the issue of aid that is coming from the United States government, and um, we had concerns about the issue of corruption that continues um, to be prevalent in the continent. We had suggestions that when aid is being channeled to African countries, there should be an agreed framework on how the resources should be managed 
and how to monitor the use of those funds to ensure that there's no misappropriation or mismanagement of the funds. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Madam? Je suis le docteur Kojo Marie-Paul de la Côte d'Ivoire. Euh, docteur Levinston a dit l'essentiel, mais j'aimerais insister sur euh, un point. Euh, C'est par rapport à une loi protégeant les, les activistes, les défenseurs des droits humains en Côte d'Ivoire. Nous avons eu une crise euh, suite à des élections et nous allons aux élections en 2015 et nous espérons qu'il y aura beaucoup d'initiatives pour permettre à ce pays de, de faire des élections apaisées et surtout de prendre en compte aussi les victimes de la, des élections de 2015. Merci. You want to interpret? Where are my French? Uh... You want to interpret? Everybody, everybody can hear? Everybody's okay? I'm the only one not okay? <laughs> D'accord, Jay Parley en français. Uh, Jay Parley. Okay? All right. Uh, anybody else? Next. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Tutu Alicante from Equatorial Guinea. Over the last couple of days, uh, several journalists have asked me to explain how is it that uh, President Obiang is in Washington, D.C., and the Corporate Council, uh, Corporate, uh, Corporate Council for Africa is holding a uh, day-long economic forum on his behalf, uh, while Mugabe and uh, Omar al-Bashir and others have stayed in Africa. And the only thing I can think of is oil. And I think it's the second half of the, of the issue that Arthur raised. I think it's important uh, that the U.S. government, the way it deals with countries that are important for purposes of energy security, take into consideration issues of human rights, issues of freedom and democracy. We have the president that has been in power the longest, 35 years in power. I was very hopeful in 2009 when I hear President Obama say, Africa needs strong institution, not strong men. We have the strongest men, or one of the strongest men, certainly the oldest person in power right now, and we hope the U.S. government helps us change that. There are elections coming up, and we really look forward to working with the U.S. government to change that. Uh, I might add that I was an um, uh, observer of the elections in Equatorial Guinea. I think I observed two of them, the presidential and also the parliamentarian elections. So I know a little bit about your country, and I've seen the the process. Another interesting twist for me uh, as an African-American, um, you know, uh, I'm from Africa. I don't know where, they, people ask me where in Africa I'm from. I say I'm from Cape Town to Cairo. You know, the whole place is where uh, I'm from. And uh, so all of the issues are reign supreme. But it's another element uh, of uh, human rights. And we are, of course, in the United States have been battling with civil rights. So there's a, there's a connection here. So when you say about the United States, Understand that the United States is big and it's broad and it has a wide range of perspectives and positions. So that's another reason why I think that this whole conversation is absolutely dynamic. Uh, to hear what you're saying about what's going on in Africa and we're thinking, internalizing this, about our own country response. So thank you very much. Any other comments? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, Introduce yourself. Yes. The name is Sakato Odije Jewel. I am the program coordinator uh, on human and trade union rights for the International Trade Union Confederation of the African Region, ITUC. We are based in Lume, Togo. We represent 17 million working men and women in Africa. Uh, for, for the workers group, we've uh, uh, come here with lots of expectations and we've had uh, discussions in the uh, last two uh, days on key issues that concerns uh, working men and women, and their communities. We'll be talking about the issues around uh, industrialization of our continent in a way that uh, it puts us out of the fringe, out of the margin of the global economy, where we could better uh, compete. The questions around how much we do that speaks to, uh, to the extent to which uh, we ourselves and investors are able to take opportunities of our mineral wealth, where we talk about beneficiations of our minerals, not just taking it uh, from the continent raw, uh, exporting jobs, exporting opportunities, revenue, uh, resources, and then coming, uh, bringing them back at costs that our people can barely uh, assess. Uh, to that extent, we are also concerned about issue of restructuring of the, uh, uh, the economy of the continent in a way that uh, speaks more to uh, uh, local content issues, in a way that speaks more to this growth that 
people talk about Africa generating in a way that it can go, it can trickle down effectively uh, to the working men and women. Because on the continent, what the reality is that we have the working poor. Men and women are job, but they, they are take home, can barely take, take them home. They are working, yet they are poor. And a million more uh, are out of jobs. And uh, at the heart of that is the question about the decent work, which is very paramount. That's so. Which is very paramount for us, the question about decent uh, job. And in that extent, we talk about the pillars of it. And uh, by the way, the decent job uh, is an agenda that the whole world have subscribed to, including the U.S. And it means if uh, the U.S. investment is coming to Africa, we want to see an investment that takes on the decent job uh, component. In other words, uh, it's a job that creates a decent employment, that gives opportunity to create employment. It's a job that talks about... Um, how we can uh, drive social protection, how men and women at work have rights, the right to organize, the right to work in safety, not to go to work uh, uh, today and the next day they are brought back in body bags or chopped off in some parts and all, all of that. That kind of, uh, and then importantly, the right to social dialogue, to discuss the working uh, reality. Uh, also, we talked about the questions around uh, what it is when we say investment come to Africa illicit financial flow. Uh, the corruption we talk about, uh, there is an Mbeki panel that uh, the AU has set up, to which we workers of the, uh, and, uh, of the continent are passionate about. This report has shown that when we talk about public corruption, the official corruption, it is child's play compared to private sector, big businesses corruption. A lot of these persons are uh, uh, taking these monies away in ways that uh, they deprive our society of uh, the uh, essential resources that, that we can use. And I thought all of that are things we need to uh, address in the course of time. Thank you. Uh, one other thing I want to say to the panelists and to other civil society organizations out here, I'm hoping that you use this opportunity to get to know one another. Uh, it's okay to know about the issues in your country, but it's important that you also start to talk to one another, you know, and even talk to some of us who are also fighting the battle even in this country, you know. Uh, talk to the brothers in Trinidad and Jamaica and Brazil. Uh, you know, the diaspora, Africa need to be talking to one another about the issues of democracy, the issues of human rights. So I wanted to uh, take that point. Any other final comments from the panel before we go to the audience? I think it was just very imperative uh, for the group. The position that we've taken is that any engagement, any commitment is that for a healthy economy, in Africa, it requires a healthy population, and that we observe the rule of law and advance human rights. Okay. Any other final comment for the panel before we go to the audience? You've all been great. You know, this is a, a very a stellar, dynamic panel. Uh, I think you have a lot of the issues uh, within you on the issues of, of human rights in Africa and human rights throughout the world, you know, so... Uh, I want to congratulate you on this excellent uh, presentation. Let's move to the microphones and uh, start our questioning. We have a microphone there and we have a microphone here. Now, it's very important that you keep it small, you know. We know our people in Africa, they like to give long speeches. And so <laughs> we know that, you know, we've seen you on TV. I've seen some of your presidents, yes. long speeches. Mm. So we want you to keep it very short and, and concise, uh, either to the panel or to any individual in the panel. So we'll start right here. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. I am John Mwanga from Atifamika, Kenya. My concern to the group is what is hindering African countries? One, we have vulnerable constitutions, which is a pending constitution. We are not following the constitution. What have you come up with for that recommendation? Two, why are we having so many challenges in, in our continent? Because the constitution. We have weak institutions. What have you come up with that recommendation? We have so many challenges in human rights because we are not empowering our women. And it starts from the bedroom outside. What have we done for our women? What have we done for civic education to educate our people to know their rights? 
they are supposed to have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I notice most of the women are lining up over here, and most of the men are lining up over there. In America, you can line up in either one, you know? You don't have to be all men over here, all women over there. That's a good thing about the United States. Right here. Merci beaucoup. Je m'appelle Modi Giro. Je suis le secrétaire général de la Confédération nationale des travailleurs du Sénégal. Je pense que nous abordons la question des droits de l'homme. Et à notre avis, le continent africain qui est cité comme un des continents qui porte la croissance est un continent aussi dans lequel nous voyons que les droits des travailleurs sont largement violés. La question que je pose, si nous voulons maintenir cette croissance en Afrique, il nous faudrait bâtir les conditions d'un environnement apaisé. C'est pourquoi je pense qu'il est bon que la société civile, dont le combat c'est le respect des droits de l'homme, des droits humains, comment cette société civile américaine et africaine devrait-elle travailler avec les organisations syndicales des travailleurs, des organisations syndicales de l'Afrique et des États-Unis, pour arriver à faire à ce que les droits syndicaux, les droits des travailleurs, les droits fondamentaux au travail qui font une partie intégrale des droits humains soient de plus en plus respectés en Afrique, parce que ces droits sont toujours violés. La liberté d'expression, la liberté de choisir les dirigeants dans, pour les travailleurs, la liberté d'avoir un travail décent et d'avoir une rémunération décente. Je vous remercie. Uh, what is your name? My name is Modi Giro. Je m'appelle Modi Giro. Je suis le secrétaire général de la Confédération nationale des travailleurs du Sénégal et président de la Confédération syndicale internationale de la région Afrique. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll take two more, and then we open it up to the panel. Go ahead. Good morning. My name is um, Michael Igodaro. I'm from Nigeria. I'm a fellow with the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission based in New York. We work in 15 countries in Africa. My, con my um, question is regarding Nigeria, Uganda, and other African countries who have at the same sense um, laws. What is the African Union doing to just to, to create a direct dialogue within the, the government and the activists on the ground for them to be able to discuss? Because sometimes I've seen that they've not been, that, that, that dialogue has not been able to happen. And um, the African Union passed a resolution recently on, this, on the same issue, but what are we doing to ensure that we create a space for communication within the activists and the government officials? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dr. Joe K. Udumakin, President Campaign for Democracy and Women Arise in Nigeria. I'm really very worried about the rise in this urgency. We had a damning report of a human rights violation in the Northeast in Nigeria. I think that what should be done on the part of the government is that government must realize that rights must be respected because it remains sacrosanct. And I also want the U.S. government to give any African country that violates rights leprous treatment. And apart from that, impunity that is being exhibited by any leader in Africa must be brought to book. The civil society group must remain impartial in their reporting so that we can also attract respectability, like Amnesty International, like Africa Watch, and several other international organizations that report flagrant violations of fundamental human rights. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll give the panel a chance to respond to these four questions, and I think they were pretty clear, pretty concise. So anyone in the panel want to respond to these questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just deal with the one raised by John Mwanga um, around the issue of uh, having good constitutions that are not complied with in Africa. That's precisely one thing that we referred to earlier on when we say that Africa does not have a shortage of human rights standards. Uh, and in, in, in terms of uh, the codification of human rights standards, we have the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, we have the African Union Constitutive Act, then virtually all African countries have got 
constitutions that have got bills of rights, and a number of them, in fact, have bills of rights that put civil and political rights on the same pedestal as economic, social, and cultural rights. And uh, a number of very progressive constitutions that have been emerging in Africa. What we saw as a concern, which is exactly what John Mwanga is confirming, is that the mismatch between development and adoption of standards and practice in terms of when African governments are exercising the governance question, there seems to be serious lack of implementation of uh, the human rights standards in those constitutions. So which means you have constitutions without constitutionalism. So one of the recommendations that came as a general recommendation is that uh, we would need to see the African Union government themselves creating a framework through which they can effectively move towards implementation of human rights standards as per constitutions, as per regional standards, but also to say wherever sub-regional judicial mechanisms have made decisions, we need to see African governments within the framework of the AU taking stain measures against each other where there is failure to implement and enforce decisions of the courts. That's the answer we give. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mukelani Dimba from South Africa. I would like to add to Arnold's uh, response regarding uh, constitutions. Um, you see, constitutions in Africa are very, very good. There was a remark made yesterday. However, th they establish uh, paper rights. Paper rights need to be given effect to through, through practice. And one of the recommendations we made in this group was support for strat strategic public interest litigation. It is solely needed. Um, we need to be able to enforce these rights that are enshrined in the, in the constitutions. And uh, there's also a need to support the building of strong uh, institutions for enforcement of rights. Uh, starting right down from at national level, dealing with, with courts, enabling courts to be able to force compliance with their judgments, going all the way up to uh, the regional levels, uh, the regional courts, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. It is quite sad to see commissioners within the African Commission on Human and People's Rights uh, essentially begging for resources, essentially relying on NGOs in order to carry out their mandates. So there is a need to invest very strongly in the enforcement of, uh, of, of, of human rights and in, in the enforcement of all of these good uh, governance practices that we have in place. That's why I, I'm worried about the focus of, of diplomacy insofar as it relates to Africa. There seems to be a migration from investing in human rights work, investing in good governance work, towards uh, focusing on economic diplomacy. Uh, it, it's a concern that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to add on to what my uh, friends here said, on the issue of constitution, uh, unfortunately, I come from Eritrea. Our constitution was ratified in 1997 and has not been implemented. So you could see that not all the African countries have constitution. Those who have constitution uh, would not want to follow up or implement what is on the constitution. And in terms of the African Union and uh, the, African, uh, uh, the African Union's engagement with the civic society, uh, it, is, it doesn't exist. And this is something that we probably need to, to really work. If the, uh, the U.S. civil societies have fought for us to come here and give our voice, um, I think we really need also us civic societies to fight for our space at the African Union, and our leaders should really hear uh, from us. And we are not uh, their enemies, we are their partners, and also concern, equally concerned about our country and people. So we need to work on that, the civic societies, we need to form a coalition and approach the African Union and challenging them. They cannot continue ignoring our existence, we do exist and we are the voice to, you know, the, the, for the voiceless. Uh, in terms of also uh, enforcing decision, the African Commission, 
Uh, I give you two examples. We have taken two cases to the African Commission, and both of them, uh, one on the, uh, the independent uh, media journalists who have been incarcerated in Eritrea since 2001, and the second one was on the uh, senior government uh, officers who have been uh, also uh, imprisoned in communicado just for asking for the constitution to be implemented. On two occasions, the African Commissions decided for those people to be freed and compensated. That was, uh, those two decisions were made in 2003 and 2007, respectively. Up to now, those people are in, the, in detention. Most of them have died in, uh, in, in, in detention. So the African Union has no power to even, the African Commission has no power to enforce its own decision. It's very weak, and uh, uh, the African Union, uh, also the leaders are not encouraging also uh, the African Commission to, to use to, to enforce its decision. So it's honestly for me, uh, for us as a whole, uh, we want the African Commission to continue, uh, but again, uh, needs resources and maybe more power to enforce its own decision. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Steve Litzika again from South Africa. Um, on the point raised about, you know, the role of AU, I think following what my colleague have just said about, you know, lack of commitment from the African Union with regards to enforcing the recommendations and resolutions made by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Um, in the last session, um, you know, the Commission have taken a resolution really around the sexual orientation and gender identity and expression after 10 years of engagement. I think, I mean, one is that it's progressive to have that kind of resolution in Africa. However, it's now ensuring that this resolution is implemented. And secondly, this resolution was taken, um, you know, after they've denied the LGBTI groups observer status in the commission itself. So I think really it has taken us so much long uh, and period uh, uh, to get to this point. Uh, efforts and progress by the human rights organizations and uh, uh, human rights defenders themselves have committed to that. So I think that resolution is a step forward for yeah. us. That's one. Secondly, in the human, uh, UN Human Rights uh, uh, Council, um, South Africa has also made a commitment, um, which for now, it's a year now, they have not necessarily uh, uh, implemented this commitment to facilitate a dialogue, a regional dialogue, to now really speak about the uh, uh, commitment uh, uh, and, and really addressing the issues and challenges facing the lesbian and gay, uh, bisexual, transgender community in Africa. However, we know that all these commitments, all these uh, uh, resolutions that are made are not a lived reality. We're still sitting with a situation here where human rights defenders, LGBTI group are displaced, arrested, and tortured in Africa. So we need to really uh, challenge that uh, conversation with the African Union that resolutions made at the Commission needs to be uh, uh, implemented and to change the situation of the lesbian, gay, or minority groups in Africa. Thank you. One thing I noticed about this panel is that you guys are all young. I don't know how old you are, but it seemed to me that most of you are under 35 or so. And uh, when I look back at Africa, <laughs> when I look back at Africa, for instance, Eritrea, I was a Peace Corps volunteer there. Uh, that was my first stop in Africa, and I went to I monitor the, the referendum on independence. I was in Asmara, 99.9% .9 said they want freedom, you know. I hear about the gay and lesbian issue in Africa, and you know, I think back 10 years ago, you know, 10 years ago, we wouldn't even have this conversation, you know. And so one thing I would advise my panel is talk to your elders, you know. Make sure you're talking to some of the ones who got a little gray in their hair, because you guys are all very young. Let's move to the next uh, round of questions. Uh, <laughs> right here. Hi, um, I'm Neetha from IREX. Um, my question is around um, what the panelists have identified in terms of um, technology and capacity or resources needed to further the three priorities that you've identified, because that would be helpful for a lot of the implementers in the room and civil society based here in Washington. Thanks. Okay, uh, here. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Abel Ngingate from Liberia. I got one concern 
with a question. The concern is this. We are talking about human rights in this building. And I believe that everybody in this hall is aware of the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. What is the concern that we are shown for this outbreak? Are we going to quarantine the whole of West Africa until everybody dies? That is my concern. This is my question. Um, the United States should have been a role model for democracy and human rights. Unfortunately, we are not seeing it coming forth. Trade unions in America are crying just as their brothers and sisters in Africa. Um, we have impunity among the African leaders. As one of the panelists said, is it because the countries don't have crude oil? You put your feet on the ground and send the Liberian former leader, Charles Tiller, to jail for crime he committed, yes. And his friends, that they were jointly perpetrating these things against humanity, humanity in Africa are still alive today. Why? I am Odas Katavu from Burundi. Uh, my question is this. Uh, you make a recommendation uh, about uh, uh, marginalized people and you mentioned human rights defender. My concern is this. Uh, at this moment we are, uh, we are going in here, we, we know that uh, uh, in many countries in Africa, there are uh, our friends, lawyers, journalists, uh, civil society organization leaders who are in prison. I would like to know what, I don't think even we need a recommendation, we need an action. What, what action can we take today, because where they are hopelessly suffering there in those horrible prisons, they expect us to advocate for them here in Washington. What is our action uh, towards those, our friends, our, uh, our brother who are suffering in those prisons? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Fred Oladende. I'm the chairman of the Agoa Civil Society Network. I'm president of the Foundation for Democracy in Africa. I want to congratulate the panel. I think the focus on trying to see how we make human rights universal, particularly when we are addressing trade and economic issues, is very important. My question to you is, how do we make sure as civil society members in Africa, how do we ensure that every time there is a trade delegation that comes into any of the capital, from the United States, from China, from India, that we organize and make sure that during those discussions, the issues of rights and the issues of civil liberties are on the table, bar none, and that this negotiation are fully in compliance with all of the rights and laws that are before the United Nations and the African Union. So what is the way forward? I am asking uh, all of you to take a look at the recommendations that came out of the Agoa Civil Society Network and to let us come up with a framework uh, of an action plan on how to make that happen. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I noticed you spoke of the role of the United States in elections, so I was wondering what role do you see the Un United States playing in ensuring free and fair elections in uh, African countries? Is it capacity building for civil societies? Um, what role do you see our government playing? Sure. Um, I'll take the last Uh, I would take the last question about elections. I think that's an easy one. I mean, I think the U.S. has uh, ample experience supporting uh, um, election monitoring in Africa and beyond. 
Um, Equatorial Guinea is a place that can definitely benefit from that, and I suspect most African nations undergoing elections can benefit from election help with election monitoring, training local people to monitor elections, working with the opposition and the governments to form independent, that's a key word that my government does not understand, independent electoral commissions. So, so there are, are ample things that uh, can be done to support elections, and I'll be happy to talk to you some more afterwards. Thank you. Oui, euh, moi, par rapport à la question sur la Constitution et la question aussi sur euh, les dictateurs qui ont commis des crimes et qui échappent à la loi, euh, je considère que les Constitutions en Afrique, elles sont belles, mais elles ne sont pas appliquées et cette gouvernance anticonstitutionnelle est, est renforcée par le soutien que prodiguent des pays comme les États-Unis à ces systèmes qui n'appliquent pas les constitutions. Ce soutien économique et militaire et politique, par exemple, que reçoit le président de mon pays, qui est un dictateur et qui a mis en prison toutes les personnes qui protestent contre l'esclavage et qui vient ici et qui est reçu en grande pompe. Et après chaque élection, certains observateurs ou spécialistes euh, des États-Unis viennent nous dire que voilà, l'élection est transparente. Moi, je pense que le problème se situe à ce niveau. Il faut que les représentants américains sachent influencer la politique de leur gouvernement vers une politique qui dit la vérité, une politique qui dénonce l'arbitraire. Et certains chefs d'État qui sont là, reçus à la Maison Blanche, doivent être là-bas en prison avec Charles Taylor. Et ça, c'est la responsabilité des États-Unis d'Amérique. C'est mon poste. Merci. Moi, je voudrais répondre à la question du monsieur qui parlait des travailleurs. En effet, euh, il a tout à fait raison de dire que le droit, les droits des travailleurs sont souvent violés euh, sur le continent. Et euh, normalement, les tribunaux devraient respecter et faire appliquer les normes connues par tous. La, la solution, euh, je crois que le docteur Levinson en a parlé euh, au nom du groupe, mais ce serait que... Euh, D'abord, les États fassent, euh, vulgarisent une culture des droits humains, à partir des, des écoles même. Parce que bien souvent, les gens ne connaissent même pas leurs droits. Ils ne savent pas donc à ce moment-là même qu'est-ce qui est violé. Et deuxièmement, euh, les travailleurs gagneraient à donc, renforcer leurs capacités sur leurs droits et leurs devoirs et s'approcher ou travailler de, euh, main dans la main avec les, les organisations de la société civile qui œuvrent au niveau des droits humains. Et ces dernières les accompagneraient pour euh, soit porter des plaintes, parce qu'il y a quand même des espaces. Il y a le tribunal du travail, il y a les, les inspections de travail. Quand un travailleur est pénalisé, il va vers ces, dans ces structures-là, mais bien souvent, il est déçu. Comment faire pour qu'il il, il ait sa raison Et enfin, dans nos pays, il, y a, pas de, il y a très peu de SMIG. En Côte d'Ivoire, euh, les servantes, les, les, les jeunes femmes qui travaillent ont un salaire, mais vraiment très, très bas. Et dernièrement, il y a un projet de loi qui, qui devait permettre l'augmentation de ce salaire et ça a été rejeté. Et j'en appelle donc aux organisations ivoiriennes qui, qui devraient faire un plaidoyer pour aider ces jeunes filles qui sont servantes à gagner leur vie dignement. Ça les empêcherait d'aller se prostituer ou de faire autre chose. Merci. Um, there are going to be other thematic groups that will talk about elections. Uh, what I'm saying is there are going to be other thematic groups. I would rather we, we be fair to those groups that are going to be talking on elections. So I think the issue of elections should be answered by the elections group. The issue of you know, technologies should be answered by their media group. And the question of you know, jail journalists should be addressed by the media group. I don't think it's fair for us you know, to be talking about those issues. The issue of you know, Ebola, we, are, we mainly work on civil liberties. We are not specialists on uh, combating diseases. So I think there are some NGOs that are doing fantastic work in that regard. But let me just maybe qualify just a little bit the connection between uh, the rights that we defend and Ebola. Governments that are democratically elected, that respects human rights, that respect free flow of information are usually better prepared for contingencies like Ebola. I don't know whether I've made myself clear. 
so usually I think the fact that I think in, in Africa we are not able to deal with such disease uh, reflects on the issue of you know, governance or how prepared we are or how we cap free flow of information. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, I think just responding on the issues of what are the resource gaps and so forth, um, it's just very critical. As our statement, uh, uh, um, you know, represented by Livingston, it was very clear that, you know, the U.S. should increase um, uh, uh, the funding, including the core funding, because we find it very hard, you know, if you're only going to focus on program funding and not core funding to ensure sustainability of these institutions. It's very key. Um, the other point that I wanted to also make um, is the point around the human rights defenders themselves. Uh, I know uh, Arnold will, will touch on that. It's, it's very key that we ensure that human rights defenders are protected because they are the cornerstone and the backbone of society. Civil society organizations do speak on behalf of society. They are informed and we want to continue ensuring that the voices of communities are represented. Lastly, it's the issues of uh, uh, you know, ensuring that public health is a basic right. And we need, whether Ebola, whether HIV, whether accessing ARVs or accessing uh, any health need, it's a public health and our government in the African state need to ensure that that health is observed. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, the last speaker's uh, point about public health, the, the Ebola question is a very important one. When we arrived here, American journalists accosted us at the airport and they were asking us about their fears if we coming from West Africa have not come to spread Ebola. And so it's an important question this uh, our summit should deal with. Uh, it's a public health. A uh, part of the problem is because there is some sense of unbridled privatization in the, private, in the, public, in the health sector that makes it difficult, impossible, that causes dispossession of the rural people from accessing healthcare. And we have come here to discuss the issues around privatization uh, should be the one that uh, should be uh, well, well, well guided. We shouldn't leave it on a kind of unbridled privatization and then dispossess so many persons and very few 1% continue to benefit and people say we are doing good, there is growth. So public health, privatization in that sector should be uh, 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 checked. I just want to speak to the point the brother raised about uh, human rights defenders, I, and, and, and I thank him for that point. Uh, this, uh, tomorrow in the morning, we'll be having uh, a protest for our uh, human rights defender in Swaziland. Uh, a, a lawyer is in jail in Swaziland. A, jo a journalist is in jail in Swaziland. And other persons are also in jail. So tomorrow, we'll be having a protest uh, at the front of the White House for these persons in Swaziland. And we want to ask our brothers and sisters here, as well as our friends, to join our Swazi comrades in pushing this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need to strengthen the enforcement mechanisms on human rights. Because all of this talk about uh, the economic development and economic growth happening in Africa, that growth will be for nothing if it's not equitably shared amongst all citizens and amongst all people in those countries where there is economic growth happening. And uh, human rights mechanisms are critical in ensuring that there is equity in, 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 in sharing those benefits accruing from economic growth that we are currently experiencing in some African countries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my concern is uh, that we need the... Uh, we need the Speaking of uh, my concern is uh, we need uh, uh, a structure in uh, our countries, in uh, regions, in sub-regions, because if we don't have uh, this uh, structure, uh, we can't do nothing. Even we come here and comply and comply, we need this strengthening. Uh, the structure in our countries, in, uh, in uh, our regions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh. Um, 
Well, I just say this to you. Uh, in Eritrea, there is no university. The only university we had was closed in 2006. And uh, what future my people would really have without education? So what I would like to say here is, I mean, I can go on and on, but I think it's not only about country here, it's the African that we represent. But uh, we would um, uh, appeal to the U.S. government to continue uh, supporting uh, human rights uh, and uh, putting pressure on the uh, regimes which are really oppressing their own people, treating them like slaves. And uh, the business interest and political interest should not be uh, issues when it comes to human rights. So we still want the uh, American people and the American government to uphold into the value of human rights and respect uh, also for human rights. Thank you. Thank you. Madam. Um, thank you. Just to add on the protection of human rights defenders that will continue to call on the United States government to continue to speak out against attacks on human rights defenders in Africa, other than just offering the financial support to human rights defenders, speaking out is the best way to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, thank you very much. Again, on human rights defenders, yes, the presence of all of us here offers an advocacy opportunity for countries like Swaziland, etc. But uh, long term and in terms of a systematic response, we also need to be aware that there has been a level of uh, organization of uh, African human rights defender organizations. We have the Pan-Africa Human Rights Defenders Organization, which is represented by Hassan here. We have the Southern Africa Human Rights Defenders Network and a number of other networks. So those networks have already been offering support. What we need is to see that the US uh, authorities, as well as the international organizations, Freedom House, or FIDH, World Organization Against Torture, ICJ, work with and through these networks to keep doing protection, security, and capacity building work for human rights defenders. Otherwise, uh, there is a lot of work that is happening there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last word. How do we bring uh, human rights at the center of trade negotiations uh, and other related uh, uh, interventions? I think in our view, this is a policy issue. At every level, we have to ensure that human rights is integrated in all discussions. We must ensure that governments in their negotiations with African states bring human rights at the center. We must amplify our voices. Actually, in Uganda, with some of my colleagues who are here, we have piloted uh, a new initiative. We call it Civil Society, Private, Public Sector Forum. And through that, we are amplifying our voices. We are bringing human rights at the center of every government uh, policy discussion. In all activities that are being carried out, whether by farmers, uh, trade unions, all other forms of associations, we are making them interested in this subject. So as human rights defenders, we should stop speaking alone. We must reach out to other sectors and make human rights their business. I want to end by saying respect for human rights is a collective responsibility. We should not see ourselves as the only front runners. Okay. We must urge all parties, whether they are states, regional organizations, individuals, even the very okay. we got local end. people to make Last sure word. that they uphold human rights. Wait. Thank you. But can we have a hand for this outstanding panel? <laughs> and we need to move to the second one. We're going to call on Carl. Congressman Chris Smith is here. Please move to the next panel. and. We're going to take it.